Okay, uh, much of what I'm going to talk about today is in a chapter in this book, Climate Change and the Great Barrier Reef, that was uh, produced by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and the Australian Greenhouse Office. And I think this is actually a really good uh, example of the way that researchers can actually uh, contribute and inform management on the Great Barrier Reef in the sort of way that um, John Tanzer was encouraging this morning. So um, it's really great to see that, that these sorts of things are happening. Um, I'd just like to also acknowledge uh, the collaborators that have been working with me on this sort of work, and in particular Jeff Jones and Morgan Pratchett, who have been uh, really important in uh, developing some of this work. OK, we've all seen these plots now. We saw a few of them yesterday, and we know that uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere are increasing dramatically. They've increased over the last 250 years, and they're now at the highest levels that they've been for over 1,000 years. And what's this mean for the climate? Well, the world is getting warmer. The average surface temperature is probably the highest it's been for the past 1,000 years. And the last decade has been the hottest on instrumental record. Where are we going with climate? Well, that depends largely on uh, what we do about emissions. And in terms of modelling it, there, there are some uncertainties in modelling the climate. But all the uh, scenarios, even the most optimistic ones, indicate that there are going to be more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and that we're heading into a warmer world. The projected climate by 2100, as we heard uh, Janice tell us yesterday, is that the global surface temperature will be increased by about 2 to 4 degrees Celsius. It could be up to 6 degrees Celsius if we really don't get serious about uh, CO2 emissions. Sea surface temperature will increase by 1 to 3 degrees Celsius. There will be uh, tropical storms will be stronger. There will be more extremes in droughts and floods. Sea level is going to go up um, by about half to a metre and possibly more if we get melting of the, or definitely more if we get melting of the ice caps. And ocean uh, pH will decrease by 0.4 to 0.5 of a unit. Now coral reefs are often regarded as uh, bellwethers of climate change because corals are very sensitive to small increases in temperature that can induce coral bleaching. And as a result, there's been a lot of research focused on the impact of uh, climate change on corals and coral communities, but there's been less attention on the impacts of climate change on other organisms that are associated with coral reefs. And so we conducted an assessment of the likely impacts of climate change on fishes of the Great Barrier Reef, and we identified some really key issues. Uh, one of the most important ones is habitat degradation. There are possible effects on individual performance, population dynamics, life histories, range uh, distributions, and there are also issues about uh, acclimation and adaptation, and I'm going to run through those uh, today. We know that um, increasing temperature will cause more mass coral bleaching, that uh, uh, reduced calcification as a result of ocean acidification and stronger storms are all going to work towards uh, reducing the coral cover that we see on reefs. There'll be less coral there and there'll be a shift in the community composition of those corals that are remaining towards resilient species. For example, we're likely to lose a lot of the uh, highly branching acroporid and posiloporid corals that form a lot of the structure of the reefs. They're highly susceptible to bleaching uh, in favour of, say, some of the parietes species, the more massive type morphologies. We estimated that around about 9% of the fishes on the GBR are coral dependent. And uh, these are fishes that depend on coral at some stage in their life, uh, either for food or for habitat. They, they must have it. And uh, these species will be directly affected by declining coral, lose their, their food or their habitat. Those fish populations are going to decline. And this is supported by a meta-analysis that uh, Morgan Pratchett and others did just recently that showed, where, whoops, that showed wherever we get uh, significant declines in coral cover, we see uh, substantial declines in these uh, coral dependent fishes. The numbers of species of, of coral dependent species varies between the families, but uh, three of the, the most important ones are the butterfly fishes, the uh, damsel fishes, and the gobies. Now, Jeff demonstrated, uh, talked about this work this morning, and uh, so I'm just going to go over it very quickly, but in a really important study up in PNG, 
Jeff Jones and others demonstrated that it's not just these coral dependent fishes that may suffer if uh, habitat declines. And they found that 75% of the species declined in abundance, of fish species declined in abundance following a serious decline in coral populations. And 50% of the species, oops, sorry about that, doing that again. 50% um, of the species declined by 50% or more. And they attributed most of this to the fact that about 65% of these fishes actually preferentially settle in or near live coral. So when they come back out of the plankton and come back down to the reef, they like to be near live coral. So it really suggests that having a healthy coral reef is really important for the replenishment uh, of these reef fish populations. We also know that fish communities often are uh, positively associated. The number and types of fishes can be associated with the structure of the reef. So we have more species and, and more individuals on reefs that have high structural complexity. And things such as uh, bleaching, acidification and stronger storms are all going to work to actually reduce the structural complexity of reefs. So we can expect a further loss of fish diversity and abundance as a result of this uh, loss of structural complexity. Of course, uh, fish and coral communities can uh, recover from disturbance, and they do over cycles of uh, 10 or so years. The problem is it, that if we're getting more frequent disturbances as a result of climate change, and that these are uh, coming more frequently, that the populations will not have time to recover before the next one hits, and we're just, they're just getting uh, knocked down time and time again. So in terms of habitat degradation, the, the uh, consequences will depend on the frequency and the magnitude of disturbances, but we can expect a few things. Uh, fewer species in local communities as a result of loss of some of these coral dependent species. Lower population sizes as perhaps a generality as a result of, less of uh, loss of settlement habitat and shelter. And there'll probably be a change in the types of communities away from those containing lots of these specialist species towards more generalist species such as generalist planktivores and rubble dwellers. Now, climate change can also affect the individual performance of fishes, and we know that temperature affects things such as the physiological condition, the developmental rate, the growth and behaviour of fishes, particularly in the larval and juvenile stages. And it's, uh, this is actually a good opportunity just to remind you that uh, most of fishes have a pelagic larval phase. These little larvae stay out in the plankton for some weeks or possibly months. When they get big enough, they come back, they recruit to the juvenile population on the reef, they grow up, <coughs> and then they reproduce at some stage and the larvae go back out. So we have this life cycle that includes a, a pelagic phase. And we know that the developmental rate of eggs and larvae uh, of fishes approximately triples for every 10 degrees Celsius. So if we're going to have a 1 to 3 degrees Celsius increase in water temperature, we can imagine that there will be effects on the performance of these little larvae and we might see things such as accelerated larval development, faster growth, and enhance reef seeking ability. And in fact, there is in general a fairly, which might in general lead to a shortening of the pelagic larval phase, shortening of the time that these larvae are out in the plankton. And in general, there is a fairly good relationship around, along, uh, between pelagic larval duration and temperature. This is for a whole range of species, uh, and the tropical ones sit a little bit higher up here on this plot. But the point is, there is a relationship between the length of time that uh, the larvae are out there and the temperature of the water. And we could ask, is this a good thing if these little larvae are spending less time out in the pelagic realm where it's really, um, there's a lot of predation, it's a very risky environment to be in, would this be good? Um, and possibly, to some degree, it might be. We might expect to see higher survival. If they're spending less time in a high-risk environment, it might be, uh, mean that there's more of these little larvae survive to reach the reef and recruit. And there is actually some evidence, um, some quite good evidence from uh, researchers here that good recruitment pulses of reef fishes are sometimes associated with slightly warmer water periods. It seems that more fish are getting through and they're in good condition. But there's also evidence that it might be more variable. And I think the po point here is that fish have to eat more uh, at higher temperatures. So higher temperature means a higher metabolic rate. So if you're growing faster, developing faster, swimming faster, doing all those things, you have to eat more and that means that there's a far greater opportunity for starvation in the pelagic realm. And what we actually predict is that there'll be more extremes in the number of larvae 
reaching the reef. And so if temperature increases, we may have some times when recruitment is really good, but we may also have some times when recruitment absolutely fails. Now, um, the success of larvae in the plankton is highly dependent on food availability. And on the Great Barrier Reef, the enrichment of nutrients, or the supply of nutrients that is uh, available for the plankton to produce the food that these little fish need is often strongly associ associated with events such as storms. And these uh, resuspend nutrients from the sediments, they uh, bring nutrients in, in uh, flood waters, and they help with upwelling. And what we seem tend to see is that uh, when we have uh, these sorts of events occurring, we get short efficient food chains with lots of these crustaceans, little copepods and things that the fish love to eat, the little larvae fish, larval fish like to eat. But if we uh, have increasing temperatures and in periods when we don't have these types of events, what we get is a very long uh, inefficient food chain with stuff that is not much use for the fish to eat. And so once again, if we think that we're going to have more extreme events, more extreme flood events, droughts, those sorts of things, we're going to get more extremes in planktonic productivity and once again, more uh, variation in larval survivorship and recruitment of reef fish populations. Going to the other end of the life cycle, so moving away from these little um, fish out in the plankton to when they're first produced, so what the adults are doing, we know that the reproductive range for fishes is actually quite narrow. It's much narrower than the range of temperatures that they can actually um, survive in and deal with, but they only reproduce over a small range of temperatures. And this was demonstrated quite nicely by Ben Ruttenberg using this little fish here, the Galapagos Island damselfish, where he found that reproductive output of the fish was maximised about 24 degrees, but it fell off very rapidly at both at uh, higher and lower temperatures. So if temperature is going to increase, uh, we might expect a few things. First of all, the breeding season of some fishes is actually cued by temperature. So we might expect that there'll be an earlier onset in breeding of some fishes, a longer breeding season perhaps, and particularly we might end up with a bimodal breeding season if the maximum summer temperature starts to exceed the optimum for them. And of course, if temperature exceeds, uh, gets too high, then we could get actually complete reproductive failure. The population dynamics of fishes, that's how many fishes there are in the population, in the adult population, and the numbers that go up and down, is strongly influenced by the numbers of the new larvae that come into the population, that recruit to the population. So if we're going to see changes in reproduct reproduction, larval development and survival, we might expect that there'll be more variable recruitment and more extreme recruitment events, and that these will flow through to mean that there'll be greater fluctuations in adult population size. A real concern would be if we got to a stage where there was a mismatch between the timing of reproduction, it was being triggered by temperature, for example, reproduction started at one stage, but the best time for the, the larval food, for the productivity out in the plankton, there was a mismatch between when reproduction was happening and when the larvae was actually being put out there, and that would be, be a serious concern. Um, we know that life histories can be correlated with temperature. Ross Robertson and Howard Choate and others have shown us that, that in some species the population, uh, the, the life histories of populations in warmer water uh, generally tend to have these sorts of traits, that they have smaller maximum size, shorter longevity and earlier maturation. So if temperatures are going to increase on the Great Barrier Reef, we might expect that in local populations we'll see the uh, life history traits in those populations move in that direction that uh, they might have smaller size, longevity and maturation. We, we also know that there's a lot of uh, variation in life history traits of fishes over relatively small scales, just for example, between the inshore and the offshore Great Barrier Reef. So it's hard to know whether these changes in life history traits will be significant compared to uh, the existing spatial variation, but they may not be. But nevertheless, um, there is at least uh, some reason for consideration of these life history traits and changes when setting things such as quotas and size limits uh, for fishes under a changed climate in the future. Uh, range shifts are a very common signal uh, for climate change and they're almost certainly going to occur on the Great Barrier Reef as a result of climate change. One thing we know for fishes in particular is that many of these fish have large ranges that extend 
already way up into the you know, equatorial regions where it's warmer already than it is on the GBR. So this suggests that probably most fishes on the Great Barrier Reef are not living close to their upper, upper thermal limits. Um, they can cope with a slightly warmer temperature. We identified over 90 species of, uh, of fish on the GBR, and there's probably a lot more than this, that have ranges that are currently restricted or they're most common in the northern GBR. And we, we don't think that we're going to see lots of shifts at the top of these ranges, because like I said, they already extend way up towards the equator. But we would expect that we may, at least in some of these species, see expansions of the ranges in the southern GBR. Probably more interestingly, we identified at least 30 species that have ranges that are restricted to the southern GBR. And we would expect that the northern distributions of some of these species will contract as temperature increases. And for some of these species, they're confined to coral reefs. As we've heard, coral reefs aren't going to migrate south, and so they're going to have smaller uh, distributions in the future, and this could actually increase their risk of extinction from other stresses. There are some fishery species that uh, can be impacted, and a very good example is Lathrinus miniatus, the red-throat emperor. Uh, it's a very popular uh, eating fish. Uh, it's both in the commercial fishery and the recreational fishery. And this one only occurs, uh, or is most abundant, south of 18 degrees south. And we would expect that that would uh, sh start to shift slightly south as temperature increases, and therefore fishing effort might also shift south with this uh, species. Also, there are a bunch of pelagic species whose seasonal migrations are influenced by both water temperature and the availability of bait fish, and temperature and ocean currents are like, that change are likely to change the seasonal migration patterns of some of these pelagic species. One thing we really need to start to think about in this whole debate is uh, acclimation and adaptation. And as I uh, said to you uh, before is that uh, we know that many of the fishes on the Great Barrier Reef have populations that already extend into the equator. So this <coughs> suggests that there is some potential for acclimation to increase temperature. Um, they're already, some of these populations are already living at higher temperatures than we're predicting will occur on the southern Great Barrier Reef. So there's, there's potential for that. Uh, there's also potential for adaptation, genetic adaptation, by gene flow from uh, low latitude populations. And there's also potential for local adaptation but this will be influenced by the generation time of the organism, how long it lives and how long it is till it gets its babies out there, and the ability to spread favourable genotypes. So those that do well in higher temperatures or something like that, how we can spread those, how quickly those genes get spread around. Now some of the little fishes, like some of these gobies and some of the wrasses, seem to only live about a year or perhaps two years on average. So there is considerable potential for local adaptation. There can be a lot of generations between now and 2100. But in some other fishes, they live a lot longer and their generation times are also considerably shorter. And so there's much less potential for local adaptation in those species. And we should really be thinking about that, that there are quite a few uh, fishes on the GBR that are long lived and may, may have relatively short generation times. Uh, relatively long generation time, sorry. Another really important issue is the one about ha habitat fragmentation. Uh, and this is a, um, a little diagram that uh, Terry Hughes put together and it really demonstrates it very nicely that uh, in a healthy reef system, uh, the reefs are connected, we have lots of uh, connections of larvae going uh, between reefs, self-recruitment, sort of things we heard this morning from <coughs> Jeff Jones. If we get fragmentation, uh, the habitat isn't as well connected, we don't have anywhere near the, the linkages between reefs and this will reduce gene flow and the potential for local adaptation. Of course, uh, if these habitats, little patches, are also um, not very good for reef fishes, if there's no coral there, then, well, fish aren't going to adapt to that at all. So just to, uh, to sum up the vulnerabilities and impacts that we identified, coral loss and uh, habitat degradation are a real key concern. They could result in the loss of diversity in local assemblages, population declines in some species, and shifts in community structure towards more generalist communities. Uh, life history shifts are likely in local populations towards smaller, shorter-lived, faster turnover populations. Uh, population dynamics could be affected, and in particular, we predict that there may be more extreme year-class events in marine fish populations and reduced scales of connectivity. Uh, range expansions and contractions are likely, but a lot of these predictions are highly uncertain. So there's a lot more work that we need to do, and we, we need to, to really point that out, that there's a lot of uncertainty. In terms of what we can do about that, we need to, rec to recognise that 
most of the fishes on the GBR are not actually commercially exploited, or they're not exploited. And you know, they're really important. People want to come and see them. Uh, we've heard about the importance of tourism this morning from an economic standpoint. So habitat protection is one of the really most important key things we can do. Uh, enhancing the reef resilience by maintaining water quality, limiting disturbances and other stresses. We do know that climate change can exacerbate fisheries collapses, so it's important that we maintain healthy stocks of those uh, fishes that are exploited. And one thing that certainly could be done is including some sort of a safety buffer into sustainable harvest levels to allow for the fact that recruitment may become more variable and more difficult to predict actually what these populations are doing. Uh, and the big one that uh, everyone has been talking about and that I just want to re reiterate is that we need to get really serious about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there are a bunch of things we really need to know quite soon. Uh, we're working on, uh, on some of these things at JCU, such as a lot more data on the effects of the physical environment, on the function and behaviour of reef fishes. We need to know a lot more about productivity on the GBR, how that's influenced by uh, storm events and those sorts of things. We need a lot more information on uh, oceanography and research on acclimation and uh, adaptation.